Welcome, folks. We're happy to see you today. Uh, we've got about 95 people registered for this webinar, so we wanted to open it up a little bit early and let you all get settled and um, log in. <clears throat> I just want to mention a couple of things with the um, Zoom webinar today. We have disabled the chat function, but you are able to ask questions of the presenter in the Q&A. So you should see a little icon that says Q&A with kind of um, speech bubbles, and you can click there and type your questions into the Q&A. And I will be monitoring those as we go throughout the webinar. If I can answer them as we go, I will. Otherwise, I'll save them till the end for Amy to answer for you. And again, you should be here for the Invasive Plants webinar, and we'll get started in just a few moments. Excellent. We're happy to see so many of you joining us today. I see a few familiar names in the audience. It's good to see you all. Got some folks joining us from Sarasota County, I see. Nice to see you, Anne. <clears throat> see. Excellent. So again, you should be here for the Invasive Plants webinar. Um, we will get started in a couple minutes if you're just joining us. Um, I have disabled the chat function for this webinar because we have about 95 people registered, but please do utilize the Q&A. Um, it is a little icon of speech bubbles that says Q&A and you can type your questions in there. I will um, be monitoring that as we go throughout the presentation and I'll try to answer those um, and uh, some that would be beneficial to the whole group. I'll go ahead and save those to the end for Amy to answer. We are recording this presentation, so it will be available um, after the fact. Uh, if you would like to review it, we will um, upload it to our YouTube channel as well as uh, you have access as a registered attendee to the on-demand function through Zoom. Um, so you should be able to just go ahead and click back on the link that you used to log into the webinar and it'll allow you to watch the recording. All right, well, I have it on my clock as one o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I just wanna start off um, by thanking you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Vinson, and I am the Residential Horticulture Agent at the Manatee County Extension Office. And I like to take an opportunity at the beginning of our webinars just to give a quick overview of what Extension is, if you're not familiar with us. Um, we are a function of Florida's two land-grant universities. We work through the University of Florida's um, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. And our main mission is to take the research that's conducted at the university and other educational institutions throughout the world and make it accessible to the folks in our communities with the end goal being to just enhance the overall quality of life for folks um, within our communities. And so Extension does that in a number of ways. Um, we have a variety of different programs. Um, here today, you're gonna see the um, wonderful work of our Master Gardener Volunteer Program, which is run through our Residential Horticulture Program. Um, I also manage the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, as well as our Master Naturalist Program and associated outreach related to um, 
urban and, and residential landscapes. Um, but we have folks in our office who work specifically with marine resources, commercial fisheries. We have folks who work with the commercial livestock industry, commercial nurseries, um, folks who are devoted to uh, working with uh, school children on uh, food and nutrition programs. So we really do have a wide variety of ways that we, that we reach out and, and touch the community. And I like to highlight a few of these impacts. These are from 2019. You can, you can see over $2.2 million of value in uh, licenses and CEUs for our pesticide license holders. And those are folks that work in the landscape industry um, or uh, you know, property managers, things like that, um, who need to get uh, continuing education for their licenses. We had over $860,000 of value in volunteer time. And that's really um, the, the lion's share of that is from our Master Gardener volunteer program. Here in Manatee County, we have over 100 Master Gardener volunteers who devote over 10,000 hours of their time every year to providing educational outreach throughout our community. Uh, we have 28,000 youth who are annually educated through the 4-H Youth Development Program, and this is through clubs um, and, and uh, programs associated with schools, as well as um, through our large event called Ag Venture, where we reach uh, most of the third graders in Manatee County. And then over 14 million gallons of water was saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. And this is due to our outreach related to water conservation in the home landscape, mainly through our mobile irrigation lab, which is associated with a landscape irrigation rebate that is run um, as a partnership between Manatee County Utilities and the Manatee County Extension Office. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna let Amy Stripe, go ahead and share her screen. She's gonna be your presenter for today. Amy Stripe is one of our Master Gardener volunteers. Amy, you've been with the program since 2012? Eight. 2008. Oh, yes, close. Since 12 years. <laughs> I'm um, looking for much my- longer than I've been with the program. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for my files. Okay. Um, and Amy is our in-house resident expert on palms and she has a uh, you know soft spot in her heart for all things invasive species related and um, she's a particular stickler stickler for binomial nomenclature <laughs> so um, you'll be uh, lucky to hear from her today um, with her presentation on invasive plants and this is the you first in series. Three. You will be if I can figure out how to share my screen here. <laughs> I've just lost my file. Hold, bear with me. Amy, you might want to exit out of that. That's your, um, that's your Zoom share screen right now. So if you want to exit gotcha. out of that. And here we go. Share your files. There you go. Okay. There we go. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Every computer's a bit different. Let me get this bar out of the way up here. Hide the floating meeting controls and hopefully you'll be able to see the presentation now. So hi everybody and thanks for joining us. As Alyssa said, this is part one of a three-part webinar series on invasive plants in Florida. Today we'll discuss how plants are defined as invasive and the invasion process and sources of information on invasive species. So today's presentation is probably gonna take about 45 minutes, give or take questions at the end. But uh, part two next week is a week from today and that will be on inv common invasive plants in our landscapes and then some, some Florida friendly substitutes for those. And part three in two weeks, we'll deal with getting control of invasives in our home landscapes. So this series is really targeting kind of the general public, homeowners, people with home gardens or, or yards, and also master gardener volunteers who kind of want to brush up on their knowledge about invasives. So I'd like to acknowledge two University of Florida scientists um, from whose uh, presentations on invasives I've drawn the bulk of my uh, presentation material today. They are Dr. Dia Lawrence. Dia is the person who manages the uh, University of Florida's assessment of non-native plants in na uh, Florida's natural areas. It's a database of over 900 non-native plants, and we'll discuss it at length uh, later on in, this, in, in today's talk. 
And then Dr. Mark Frank, who is the University of Florida Extension botanist. He is among many other uh, valuable resources to us. He is our go-to person for plant identification. So why is information on invasives important to you as a homeowner or a person with a home landscape? Well, suburban residential landscapes and roadsides are disturbed habitats that are often ideal for colonization by invasive plants. And our yards and streetscapes are, can be a reservoir for, from which invasive plants are dispersed to natural areas by wildlife, by water, by wind, and heavy machinery, which could be as, as innocent or innocuous as your, your lawnmower. Um, this little chap here, the bottom photo on the right, is a fish crow. He loves carrot wood seeds. Carrot wood is an invasive species. And um, the reason why it's important to understand how this impacts you is that, for example, I live about two miles as this crow flies, no pun intended, uh, from the entrance to a natural uh, a county preserve. And I know that stuff from my yard can get transported by this, this fellow to the preserve because I know he's transported stuff from the preserve to my yard. Now, I happen to be the lucky recipient of a gumbo limbo seed. That's a nice native tree um, that is only growing in the preserve, nowhere else in my neighborhood. And it popped up about a year and a half ago. It's a beautiful tree. But this is why it's important to understand that what we do in our own home landscapes can really impact our natural areas. So today's presentation is kind of the heavy lifting uh, part of the three-part series. We're going to talk about definitions, you know, labels that we use when we talk about invasiveness. We're going to talk about the invasion process, characteristics and impacts of invasive plants, and then some sources of invasive identification in Florida. And then just for grins, I've gone through and put in a few examples of some invasives. This picture is of, um, it's called beach scavola or scavola tacata. It was introduced to Florida as a beach erosion uh, measure, you know, to help beach erosion, and it has become invasive. It is now a prohibited plant in Florida. So the definitions we're going to look at today are what is a weed, what is a native, what is a non-native or exotic, you'll see those two terms used interchangeably, what is an established or naturalized plant, those are also two terms that are used interchangeably, what is an invasive and what is a noxious weed? Uh, I must say the first thing to know is that not all non-native species are invasive. And by the way, these terms here are not necessarily mutually exclusive to, even, to make it even more confusing, but hopefully we'll clear this up. So what is a weed? A weed is a subjective term for a plant growing where it is not wanted. It could be native or non-native. This is a picture of spotted spurge this is a uh, euphorbia maculata. In my yard, that's a weed because I don't want it there, but it is a native. So what is a native? Well, a native is a plant that was present in Florida before significant human impacts and alterations to the landscape. And we define that as the time of first European contact when those Spanish explorers first kind of splashed ashore in 1513. Now, in other parts of the country, that timeline is, it can be different. For example, I know in the Midwest, the first time of significant uh, European, or, or I should say human impact by Europeans was in the 1700s. So it's a much, much later kind of line in the sand, as I call it. Now, this is not to say, of course, that indigenous peoples did not trade or transport plants, but in all probability, they did not do so from half a world away. So botanists determine native plants based on herbarium and fossil records, descriptions by naturalists, and then habitat details. If you have a plant species, for example, that's found only in disturbed areas, just areas that have been modified, um, it may be an indication that is, that's probably not been there very long and it's therefore not native. Uh, they also look at the distribution of species in uh, areas adjacent to Florida uh, to determine if it's native or was introduced. Now, Florida has many plant species in common with the Caribbean and also the southeastern United States. Um, common and scientific names often give us clues about that, like you'll hear the term Jamaica caper tree, that's the common name, for a plant that is considered a Florida native. Also, Quercus virginiana is the live oak, that's also considered a native of Florida. Now, botanists don't always agree 
This is the lovely little Alamo vine here, Distamachi dissectus, that is a vining member of the Morning Glory family, long regarded as non-native, but it has since been reclassified as a native. I don't know the details about what was the tipping point there, but it could have very well have been some molecular analysis like DNA or something that could have impacted that. So now what is a non-native? So a non-native is an alien or exotic species that was introduced either purposefully or unintentionally outside of its natural past or present distribution. So the picture on the left is the lovely Bougainvillea glabra that is native of South America, was introduced as an ornamental. Uh, it is not native of Florida, okay? The picture on the, on the right is good old Cocos nucifera, the coconut palm. He's not native to Florida, but we do not know really if it was introduced intentionally or accidentally. Of course, the, you know, the seed of a coconut palm, i.e. the coconut, uh, can travel thousands of miles across the sea, plunk on a beautiful sandy shoreline like this one, and germinate. Anybody that's ever had a coconut palm and has had a coconut fall to the ground and left there, you will see that it probably will germinate. Um, so it could have been accidental. It could have been on purpose. Um, coconut palm is a source of a very important commercial crop. It's copra. Um, so it could have been introduced for commercial purposes. But interestingly, just a little sidebar, after, after many, many, many years of intensive study, botanists have finally concluded or gotten close to concluding that they think it's a native of the South Pacific. Uh, now, of the 4,000 plus species that are growing on their own in Florida, meaning outside of cultivation, outside of captivity, of the 4,000 species in Florida, about 30% of them are not native. So that's about 1,400 plants. Oh, and just by the way, the coconut palm is considered invasive in South Florida. So is it native or non-native? But I, oh, let me just back up and say, though, first of all, it's either a native or non-native. It can't be. Those are two very distinct categorizations for plants. So there is definitely a division there. Um, we were working on a group of us master gardeners a couple of years ago. We're working on some fact sheets for each of the individual plants in our uh, educational gardens, as well as the plants that we were selling at our annual plant fair, which, by the way, is now going to be March 6th. Mark your calendars. <laughs> So, but in doing so, we wanted to put, you know, in, in talking about the different plants, we wanted to make sure that we put down nativity because many people want to focus on native plants. Well, we were finding conflicting information from authoritative sources on nativity. So I asked Dr. Frank, I said, what source is the best? And he said, uh, very simply, the Atlas of Florida Plants. And it is available here at the, this URL, the one on the top, Florida Plant Atlas, usf.edu. Or if you're just like me, I just Google Florida Plant Atlas USF and it gets me there. Um, this is a database of about, I don't know how many species are in there, but it's only natives and non-natives that have become established or um, naturalized. We'll get into that definition in a minute. Uh, the Florida Native Plant Society has another, is an excellent source of information on native plants. What are native plants? If you haven't been there recently, they've revamped their website. So it's worth a visit uh, to, to go to see what they've done differently. So I'm just a screen grab here. This is what the Atlas of Florida Plants looks like. Um, up here, there's a search box and you can put down either scientific name or common name. There's a number of ways you can search for a plant. This drop down menu gives you that option. So in this case, I put in Hamelia Patens and it took me to a link saying, is Hamelia Patens what you want? Yes, it is. Clicked on that, it brought me here. And you can see the information. It gives me the family, Rubiaceae, it gives me the, the um, species name, and then it gives me the common name, Firebush. And then importantly, the status, native. In addition to other information about that particular species, you can also look at a species distribution map. So this species has been vouchered in the dark green counties. That's not to say it's not growing in other counties, but it's only been, samples have been collected for herbariums from these counties. And here's our good old Cocos nucifera, our coconut palm. So it is in the palm family and the common name coconut palm, and here it is not native. 
Now, interestingly enough, it's only been vouchered. I think this is like Miami Dade and maybe Monroe counties. It's only been vouchered there, not to say that it's not throughout uh, Central and South Florida. But that's that's just kind of an interesting aside. Okay, so what is established or naturalized? We've referred to it a couple of times. So that is a plant species that maintains a population outside of its native range and outside of cultivation or captivity, it's, it's sometimes called. So that's like man-made or man you know, controlled by us. <laughs> um, it's a, so it's a non-native species that has established in the wild. And I was trying to think of an example. Not all, of course, naturalized species are invasive. So I was trying to think of an example of one and I was out in my yard this morning and I just ran across, I have a, a conservation easement area behind my house and I ran across the Cupid Shave Brush um, and Cupid Shave Brush, which is Dioscoria, I'm oh, no, sorry, wrong, Amelia, it's Amelia. Amelia fosbergii is a naturalized plant but it is not invasive. So what is invasive already? <laughs> invasive is a naturalized or established species that is expanding in the wild, displacing native species and altering the ecology of natural communities. And the emphasis is typically on ecological impacts. Uh, depending on the organization making the assessment about the particular plant, they may or may not include economic impacts as well. But uh, these are pictures over here on the left of the famous uh, air potato vine. Air potato grows very quickly, about eight inches a day. It can uh, topple trees in high winds, it disrupts natural water flow, and does suffocate out native species. So that's a prime example of an invasive plant. The term invasive is often misapplied to uh, cultivated context and native species, i.e. to plants like in our yards, or to native species. Uh, this is a picture here of the common cattail. And now I live, I live in a baby HOA and across the street from my house is a, is a drainage easement, which is typically in the rainy season, it's underwater. And so things like cattails will spring up there um, every year. And so I was, had a meeting with my board of directors and I was trying to convince them not to, try, not to mow that area in the summer because it's a muddy mess. And the mow decks, you know, the, the mowers were getting you know, stuck in the mud, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the board members turned to me and in a very indignant voice says, how can you live across the street looking at those invasive cattails? Well, of course, a cattail, this is Typhalatifolia, is actually a native. Yes, they do, they can spread, you know, cover large areas of, of water, you know, bodies of water and wetland areas, but it is a native species. So aggressive nuisance and invasive are not the same thing. And a native plant by definition cannot be invasive. All right, our last definition, what is a noxious weed? This is an invasive plant that is actually regulated by statute, federal and or state and or municipal as injurious to agricultural, horticultural crops and or natural habitats or ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> I should say that it is geared largely towards nurseries, to commercial people, people that grow plants for a living. And in, in loosely, it says the introduction, cultivation, and importation is prohibited. And I say generally speaking, I think there are three uh, aquatic plants on, that, on the noxious weeds list that uh, people are allowed to grow commercially, but they have to, they cannot sell them within Florida. They have to be sold for export only. Here are two examples of noxious weeds. This is water hyacinth uh, on, in the top photo, and then there's that rosary pea vine at the bottom. Rosary pea, funny story, when I first moved into my house in the conservation area, there was just loads and loads of rosary pea vine. And of course, those, those, the rosary pea itself is quite, quite toxic uh, to, to people. So it took me about two years and I did manage to get rid of it. But there's nothing in the regulation that mandates I would have had to remove it. There's no sort of teeth to it to, tell, to make a homeowner remove one of these noxious weeds. Um, unfortunately, the regulation uh, in this area is sadly enacted before the problem is out of control. So. 
All right, just let's recap the definitions here. Anybody remember Venn diagrams from new math? Well, this is what this is. So there are two, the pl two plants come in two flavors, either native or non-native. Now within the non-native bubble, uh, this is the non-native bubble, there are those that have become established or, or have become naturalized. Within that group, there are those that have become invasive. And within that group, there are those that are prohibited, noxious weeds. Now, the size of these bubbles isn't meant to say how many plants are in each one of these uh, classifications. It's just meant to show um, relationships. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the invasion process. Um, Florida's geography, climate, diverse ecosystem make it particularly vulnerable to invasives. We are a trade and tourism hub. How many of you knew that we had 14 international airports in Florida? Uh, we have 14 deep water ports. We have three major interstates. We have water on three sides of our state. We have a climate that has year round growing seasons um, with tropical and subtropical climates. We have ecosystems that include wetlands, coastlines. We have more coastline, by the way, than any state in the Union except Alaska. Um, uplands, forests, agricultural lands, etc. Uh, about 85% of all non-native species enter the United States via Florida. And this is not just plants. This is also insects, diseases, animals, okay, enter the U.S. via Florida. Um, and by the way, Florida ranks number one in the country in terms of number of invasive species in our natural areas, followed by Hawaii and then California. But we're number one. What a great distinction, huh? Uh, and by the way, e-commerce... Uh, helps move invasives. About 20% of in, uh, plants that are classified as invasive are available for purchase over the internet. Uh, of the 1,400 uh, non-native plant species that are uh, naturalized, about 10% uh, about of them are classified as invasive, so that's about 130 plus. And then another 10% are classified by the University of Florida as having a high invasion risk. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, this chart uh, shows kind of the steps in the invasion process, and then it really illustrates that uh, not all non-native species become invasive. So there are four stages here. There's transport, introduction, establishment, and spread. And then at each one of these stages, there are barriers that prevent that particular plant from becoming invasive. So for example, at transport, geography is a barrier, meaning getting it from there to here. That might be a barrier. In terms of introduction, as long as it's in captivity or cultivation, it will not become invasive. In terms of establishment, now once it has escaped captivity or cultivation, will it survive on its own out there without, without intervention by us, okay? And will it reproduce? It has to be able it, to survive, it has to reproduce. So if it fails to do that, again, it will not become invasive. The last stage is a spread. How efficiently does it, is it dispersed? Does it produce a lot of seeds? And what environmental factors might stand in the way of it becoming invasive? Like, you know, climate, for example, that's, that's probably a number one reason why. So not all introductions will result in an invasion. So let's take a look at how a particular non-native non plant could overcome some of those barriers. This, uh, this figure is to, sh is to show you two things. One, uh, the interconnectivity of the world. This is shipping routes. Um, and also the volume of travel. This is by air, that was, this is by air, that was by sea. And you can see that pretty much geography, not much of a barrier, probably for most non-native plants anymore. Now let's look at the introduction. Um, there are pathways for introduction. Intentional pathways include forestry, agriculture, ornamental plant trade. You would be, or maybe not, amazed at how many of our current invasives we actually brought in up upon ourselves. Um, this is the lovely carrot wood right here, in, imported by um, the nursery trade as a lovely shade tree for Florida lands or yards. And it is a wonderful shade tree, but it also reproduces like mad. Um, this is the Malaleuca tree down here, and the Malaleuca was also introduced as ornamental, but at some stage of the game, somebody got the idea that if it was planted extensively in the Everglades, it would suck up all that nasty water, 
and solve that problem. Well, we know better now. Um, accidental uh, pathways include hitchhikers. Or your coconut palm could be one of those. Uh, it could also be plant material coming in on desired plant material, you know, un un inadvertently, but that's definitely a possibility. A lot of times people think plant material can be brought in on hurricanes. Uh, don't know a lot of facts about that, but that is a possibility. So in terms of establishment, um, many factors influence establishment, but what might be the most important is climate matching. So this is, shows you with these lines, this shows you how much of the rest, how much of the continental United States lines up with the rest of the world. And especially in Southeast Florida, I'm sorry, Southeastern United States and Florida, how much of us lines up with some very diverse ecosystems across the world. So this shows you just a distribution of the mimosa tree. This is Albizia gilabrisson. And its native range is really sort of the Caucasus, Iran into Asia Minor, Central China, Japan. All right, but now you can see from these dots where it occurs every place else in the world. It's now in New Zealand, South Australia. It's in uh, Western Europe and in most of the uh, you know, continental United States where it is considered an invasive. Now spread. So here's some common characteristics of invasives. Okay, this is where we talk about dispersal and environmental factors. So they tolerate a wide variety of habitats and growing conditions. They grow and reproduce rapidly. There's high seed production and efficient dispersal. They compete aggressively for resources and they lack natural enemies to keep them under control when they're outside of their native range. So this is our famous, of course, Brazilian pepper tree. This is Shinus uh, terebinthifolius, which by the way, infests about 700,000 acres of Florida, uh, was introduced, was introduced. Uh, it will grow in hammocks, it'll grow in pine forest, agricultural land, fallow land, swamps, tree islands, pretty much you name it, it'll grow there. It, uh, it has, takes a very short amount of time for it to reproduce, uh, to reach re reproductive maturity, has a ton of seed production, very efficient seed dispersal, lots of, lots of wildlife disperses it. It does compete aggressively for resources and has an added little tool in its, in its uh, arsenal, which is it is allelopathic, meaning that it will emit uh, toxic, um, chemicals to, to prevent or to suppress other plants from growing in its vicinity. And it also lacks natural enemies to keep it under control. Now, interestingly enough, in its native range, which is in um, Northern Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, uh, there are thrips, borers, it has plenty of natural enemies. And if you stay tuned for part three of the webinar, we'll talk about some of those and some of the things that uh, scientists are doing to try to introduce biological controls to Brazilian pepper um, here in Florida. Now, impacts of invasives, um, it, it's a laundry list. They displace native species, reduce wildlife habitat, reduce forest health and productivity, they alter ecosystem processes, reduce agricultural productivity, and of course, degrade recreational areas. Who wants to go hiking amongst all of this old world climbing vine right here? So, you know, invasives often form dense single species stands like this one that dominate their space. Um, some have that allelopathic property, such as Australian pine and Brazilian pepper tree. And then, you know, animals that use native plants for food and habitat pretty much can't make use of non-native plants. Um, a good example of this is the Australian pine, which we've planted extensively, at least here on the, on the Gulf Coast, in beaches to prevent beach erosion because they have really shallow, dense root systems. Well, that very same shallow, dense root system that we thought we wanted for erosion control precludes our uh, sea turtles from making their nests up there on the beach. Um, also, the uh, I think the American crocodile that also in, in, you know, gets in the way of, of that species making its nest, just as a couple of examples. Um, Kogon grass, which is a, a grass that was introduced as fodder grass, and it's a huge problem in a large, large parts of the world. Kogon grass, um, it, when it burns, it burns so hot, it kills fire adapted plants like our native um, pines, our native wire grasses. 
uh, the picture on the top there on the right is actually Malaleuca on fire. You know, Malaleuca has that papery bark. And what that does is it takes the fire from the understory and it, it creates up what we call a ladder to take it up to the canopy. And then so your fire adapted plants uh, that are used to having just kind of ground fires in the area get destroyed. Uh, but Malaleuca pretty much survives this, <laughs> survives this, uh, this, uh, this trial. Um, aquatic invasive plants, of course, can harm fish habitats, impact fishing, boating, etc. This is hydrilla. Uh, this was taken, I don't know what lake this was taken in Florida, but this is a before and after. Uh, once we went in and they tried to get control of the hydrilla. Now, hydrilla was, a, was an aquarium plant that was uh, introduced and aquarium plant growers were cultivating it in canals. It quickly escaped cultivation and is a huge problem. Uh, it, it really does inhibit, it, it's also spread easily by people boating. It gets on the boat, they forget to wash the boat off or don't wash it off well enough, introduce the boat into a new body of water, boom, there it goes. Um, I can tell you that um, this, the after picture, they probably utilized a number of different measures to get the hydrilla under control, including biologicals. There's uh, carp, fish, you know, fish that, that will feed on it, but also herbicides and other mechanical means. It's a terrible, terrible problem. So just to give you an idea of the impacts of invasives in Florida, um, it's the second largest threat to biodiversity after habitat destruction. Over 50% of our endangered and threatened plant species are negatively impacted by invasives. They impact 1.5 million acres in Florida and 100 million is spent annually on invasive plant management, largely in the area of aquatic noxious weeds. This is a cool, a very cool chart, which quickly just shows that um, the, this is top, you know, on the left hand here is, is area invaded, on the right is management costs, and then time goes across here. It shows that as you move through these, these different stages of trying to keep this thing under control, uh, the area invaded goes up as does, the, as does the management costs. So failure to prevent or eradicate or containment basically increases over time the area invaded and the management costs. So prevention obviously is the very best option. Second best option would be uh, identify quickly. So, you know, early detection and rapid response here at the eradication stage. So let's talk about sources of invasive identification in Florida. There are four important plant lists. We'll go through each of these. The first one is FLEPSI. We call that FLEPSI. That's the Florida Exotic Pest, uh, Pest, Pest Plant Council. And their job, they report and predict invasive plants. The University of Florida's assessment also reports and predicts. And then FDAX, okay, here's a mouthful, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Department of Plant Industry has a noxious weed list and a prohibited aquatic plant list. So both of those are regulatory. These first two are non-regulatory. So FLEPSI, we'll start with them. Um, this is a group of people, volunteers, they're botanists, ecologists, and land managers. Uh, these are people from areas uh, such as, um, you know, Fish and Wildlife, the University of Florida, the Corps of Engineers, uh, FDEP, the Environmental Protection uh, Group, as well as the National Park Service, so on and so forth. And they update this every odd year, their list of invasive plants. The last one was 2019, so expect a new one next year. Largely based on observation, they focus on problem plants in natural areas. You could access it at this URL or take the lazy way out like I do, and I just Google FLEPSI list, F-L-E-P-P-C list. They have two categories. Category one is plants that are altering native plant communities. There are 80 species in that list currently. Category two is plants that are increasing in abundance or frequency, but not currently altering native plant communities, 79 species there. Um, these plant, plants move back and forth occasionally between these two categories. Uh, three regions of impact, North, Central, and South Florida. So here's what it looks like. It actually, there's actually a downloadable brochure um, I don't know if you can see it, down a little bit, sure, which is like a trifold. And so I just did a quick screen grab of some category one invasives here. You can see here uh, the description for it. 
Uh, this, it says, invasive exotics that are alter native plant communities by displacing native species, changing community structures or ecological functions, or hybridizing with natives. This definition does not rely on the economic severity or geographic range of the problem, but on the documented ecological damage caused. So you can see here, there's our famous rosary pea, our Aberus precatorius, Central and South Florida. It's a category one. And you can look down, Central and South Florida for the acacia, the early acacia. Down here, we're looking at coral ardisia, a problem throughout the state. Category two is invasive exotics that have increased in abundance or frequency, but have not yet altered Florida plant communities to the extent shown by category one species. So these species may become category one if ecological damage is demonstrated. So this is another list of about 79 to 80 plants. All right, University of Florida's assessment of non-native plants in Florida's natural areas. This is the go-to list for IFAS people, master gardeners, when we make recommendations for use of non-native plant species in landscaping. It is a non-regulatory list. It is updated on a continuous basis. Importantly, it empl employs a quantitative predictive tool, and it also divides plants into North, Central, and Florida regions of impact, over 900 plants. And again, I Google it at UFL assessment. It takes me right there. The methodology, there are three, um, three tools that are used. There's a predictive tool. This is for species not currently in natural areas in Florida. There are 49 questions in this uh, review, a series of questions to determine invasion risk. It asks things like uh, growth habits, seed dispersal. Is it a weed of agriculture? Is it suitable to our climate zones? Does it have weedy cousins, et cetera? The next tool is called the status assessment. That's for species that are already in Florida natural areas and it incorporates input from experts in the field. The last uh, tool is the infraspecific taxon protocol for newly developed cultivars. The possible conclusions, they, we list them as red light, yellow light, or green light. So if you go to the specific page of a particular plant in this database, the conclusion will be in a red box, a yellow box, or a green box. And that's what this means. Red light means not recommended. And you might see the red, in the red box, it might say prohibited, it might say invasive, it might say invasives, no uses. Uh, invasive, no uses means in some cases, invasives can be recommended as long as best management practices are followed to keep it from escaping from captivity. But when you see invasive, no uses, it means just that, no exceptions. Uh, high invasion risk is where we've employed that predictive tool and we have said not there yet, but it looks like it could be. Looks very likely that it could be. Yellow light means may recommend it, but manage to prevent escape. Um, you'll see caution or you'll see moderate risk or evaluate. Again, moderate risk means they've implied, employed the predictive tool. And then green light is okay to recommend. It's either not a problem species or low invasion risk. Again, using that um, that predictive tool. So here's what the homepage looks like. This is a fantastic uh, database. I can't say enough about it. The pictures are very, very good. It's very user-friendly. You can type in here uh, the name of the scientific name or a common name. It will take you specifically to the page on that particular plant. There are great photographs and there's information there about the status of that plant. You can also go over here to this assessment, and that will give you a snapshot of every single plant in the database uh, with links to their pages within the database. You can also download in spreadsheet form um, a number of different ways uh, to, to parse it up. For example, you can, if you just want to know uh, red light plants for North Florida, you can, you can sort for that and it will give you a spreadsheet with just that information. Um, I have done my own hard copy <laughs> because that's how I am. Uh, and what I have is I put down, I sorted for North, Central and South Florida, all the red light, all the yellow light species. And I update this as often as it needs to be updated as you can probably see my copies kind of ratty and dog-eared. And I also have it by alphabetical by scientific and alphabetical by common name. So, but let's take a look at what some of these uh, 
species look like. So this is the, this is the uh, mimosa uh, tree. This is the Albizia gerberissum. And you can see here that the, uh, the conclusion is invasive, no uses. And this was using the assessment status, not the predictive tool with the assessment status. So that means that this has already escaped cultivation. It's already out in natural areas. Here's a yellow light. This is caution. This is Zamia uh, furfuracea. This is the cardboard palm. And this is a, a caution for Central and South using the status assessment. And here is the bougainvillea again, uh, bougainvillea glabra, green light, not a problem species in North Central and South Florida. Here's the mixed bag. This is the sapodilla. This is uh, Menocara sapota, a nice fruit, but it is considered invasive in Central and South Florida, not a problem species in North Florida, probably because of the climate. Here's an example of where we've used, where the predictive tool has been used. This is on sword fern. Do not ask me to say this scientific name. I will never get it out. Um, but this is considered a high invasion risk in North in Central, North, and South Florida. And you might go, well, why is that? Well, happily enough, if you scroll down on this page, there, there's a little link down here which will take you to the questionnaire uh, with the 49 questions by which it was scored, and the score was high enough that it's considered high invasive risk. So plenty of information on that. Now, um, one thing I must say is that the FLEPSI list and the University of Florida assessments don't always line up 100%. You may recall looking at the uh, Rosary P, the very first entry in category one on the FLEPSI list. It was a category one only in Central and South Florida. If you go to the University of Florida assessment, it is listed as a prohibited species throughout the state, so all three regions. So they don't always quite you know, line up with one another. But it's always good to consult both lists and then go with the most conservative approach. Um, because that way you're, you're, you're probably gonna be the safest. All right, the last list we're gonna look at is that FDAX DPI list. There's the noxious weeds. You can see here introduction, possession, movement, all life stages prohibited. The prohibited aquatic plant list says possession, collection, transportation, cultivation, and importation prohibited. So there's about 74 species. In the noxious weeds list, there's about 24 on the prohibited aquatic plants list. Right, so that's what I have for you today. I hope you will join us next week, part two, Invasive Plants and Home Landscapes. And I know a lot of you recognize this little rascal. This is really simplex. This is the, um, this is the uh, Mexican petunia. And I have quite a tale to tell about, about this chap um, in next week's webinar. So that's it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a great introduction um, to invasive plants. Um, there was a question that came in to the Q&A that I wanted to um, go ahead and tackle. Um, so somebody has a question about HOA requirements for removal of invasive species. And um, I wanted to uh, answer this question, particularly because it, it depends on what area in the HOA landscape you are, um, you're talking about, and it also depends on, on which regulatory agencies have jurisdiction over um, parts of your landscape. So for instance, if you have an area within your managed community that is designated as conservation or preservation on your plat. And this is information that can be found through a public records search. Those areas generally have some sort of resource management plan. And that resource management plan will lay out um, whether or not invasive species these um, are required to be removed or whether there is some other kind of maintenance that is expected. So that is specific to those conservation and preservation areas as designated on your plat. In common areas in your HOA landscape, there may or may not be requirements within your individual neighborhoods um, landscape plan or you know, other kind of um, governing documents that require removal of invasive species. Otherwise, there are no um, state or local ordinances that can require an individual to remove a plant that is on private property. It can be suggested and there's often no permit required 
for removing an invasive tree on one's own property, um, but there is there's no law that requires individuals to remove a plant. Most of the regulations that are in place are in place to prevent the propagation and sale of invasive species um, by the nursery industry. And that is handled through the um, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services or FDACs. Mm -hmm. I hope that that helped answer that question. It was, it was a pretty um, in-depth question, so I wanted to take a chance to <laughs> to talk a little bit about it. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information, in, in my previous um, uh, experience, I worked in Sarasota County for their Environmental Protection Division. Um, and so I do have some experience in um, the regulatory realm as far as 